Welcome to After Painting. So what does one do when one has finished painting the great majority of their never-ending horde of unpainted lead board gaming miniatures? I don't know. So that's what we're going to find out in this show. Uh, so stay with me. Uh, leave your comments, suggestions, and concerns. And let's go and see what life is like after painting. Welcome to After Painting. So those of you who have been uh, following my channel for some time now probably will remember this series, which I probably started uh, a little over a year ago. And basically uh, what this series is about, for those of you who are new, is I kind of do kind of a variety show as far as uh, what's going on with my miniatures and my hobby. In the past, I've kind of focused on projects if I was doing a build or so forth. So uh, for a while, I had kind of put the show in hiatus. And I was basically uh, not going to bring it back until I got to a thousand subscribers for a lot of reasons which I've discussed elsewhere. But over the past months, I've had a lot of things build up. And so rather than do five or six different little videos, I figured I'd put them all together and do another show. Now, this will probably be a special show, meaning uh, uh, I probably won't. You know follow it up anytime soon unless like I said I get to a thousand subscribers so I'm gonna try to squeeze in as much as I can uh, if you're gonna hang around for the whole show uh, go grab yourself some coffee maybe get comfortable on the couch uh, you know maybe take out your paint and your uh, brush and some waters but one of the things I will be doing today is I will be showing you some of my favorite miniatures that I currently have in my collection. And just to give you a hint, some of them are in here. So some of the some of my favorite miniatures in my collection. Now I'm not gonna necessarily say my favorite because I do have a good deal of miniatures that are boxed up and put away. So I can't, uh, I don't wanna rude them guys out because I might have some good ones in there. But presently, my recent additions and recent paint jobs, I am going to pick probably my three favorite ones right now. But that'll be later on in the show. For now, let's uh, let's get to the first session of After Painting. Okay, so what I'm going to do is kind of a quick paint uh, painting exhibition on this uh, Churchill Crocodile tank. And I did this because I got a comment uh, from one of the viewers that asked, said when I built it that he, would, he was hoping to see me paint it. So I'm not going to do the step-by-step -step painting, but I will... I will pause in between what I'm doing and kind of come back. But what you can see right here now is I have I have already primed this. And this is kind of a, I think it's like a brown earth color. Uh, and this is, a, I think it's like, I, I got it like as a, at a small can. I think it's either the Testers or the Vallejo small spray can. So I primed it with black. And, and then I went over it with the earth color because I want this to have kind of a, a desert uh, a desert color scheme, you know, that they would have used in, uh, I guess that was that uh, Africa or Egypt or even Italy, I guess. So that's all I've done so far is I've given it the black and I always like to do a black tone even when I buy the cans like that because it adds some shadows to the vehicle which are not apparent, but it is apparent if you don't do it. But then also what I've done is what's called pencil lining. So you will see in certain areas like here where I have went and lined most of all of the major lines on the vehicle to give the impression of just wear and metal. And that's called pencil lining. And I just use a regular number two pencil. 
but you can get some nice effects around the joints and the rivets and things. So what I'm going to do now as you guys are joining me is I am going to, I am now going to do, uh, I'm trying to think of a word for it, but basically I am going to now apply some damage spotting and that is done using just basically a sponge and some I think I use I think I use Panzer gray let me see German gray Vallejo German gray and essentially you're going to dab this in there and then dab it around the vehicle and you're just trying to create the effect of chipping I think that's what they call it chipping some people use a chipping medium where you put it on before you spray and things like that I don't I've tried those I don't really I didn't get good results but anyway I'll be back and show you what this looks like after we do the basic sponge chipping What you are looking at here is a recent eBay pickup. And these are some old school Marauder miniatures, which I think most of these I got for maybe $3 or $2 each. Uh, I remember Marauder when they came out. And I actually think some of their miniatures were used... Uh, like in some of the early uh, war game rules, you would see images of Marauders, especially their Ls or their Dark Ls. So this appears to be some sort of elf. I cannot tell what that is in his hand. Whether it's like a broken piece of a cannon or something. This is another one. He appears to be a leader, which I really like. You will notice the uh, kind of the uh, the bump or the protrusion on their arms. Those were for the old style Citadel shields, which had which had holes in them, and you would actually place the holes over. That I mean, place the shield right there in the hole, and that would fill the hole and look like the uh, what they call the boss on the shield. I think I still have some of those too. I'm going to check my bits box. This guy looks kind of interesting. He's Now this was actually probably one from their Chaos range. Now I think, I don't know if Raw Parta did Marauder or if Marauder uh, did some of Raw Parta's. But some of these may not be Marauder. I know that the, the, the eBay auction said they were all Marauder but... Some of these look like they may just be straight up raw parta. One of them I think for sure is a games workshop. But unfortunately I lost my focus there. Let's see if we can get it back. No, it's not going to come back right there. Not for that one anyway. So let's try this one here. There we go. So again, you can see the the protrusion for the boss of his shield. Let's see if the tab says Marauder. I cannot read that. I think it just says Dark Elf. And we have another one here. He's a dual wielder. I can't really make out that tab. It might say L5 or something. I really like these L's. You don't really see these style of L's anymore. Uh, you know, they have kind of more of a gritty feel to them. This, I think, is obviously a Games Workshop miniature. But the funny thing is, I used to re be real big in Games Workshop Bretonia miniatures back in the day, including the Knights and the Knights Errant. And I do not remember this miniature because this guy has a very elaborate crown. And I can tell you, I do not have this in my collection. 
So I paid, I think this one I got bidded up to $7, but I wasn't going to lose this one. I would really like that crown on his head. You know, GW Shield, he was on one of the GW little horses, but I pulled him off. I'm going to remount him on a separate horse. But that's kind of, that's kind of the first thing I wanted to show you guys on my table recently. Just because, you know, just for nostalgia's sake, to show you some, uh, some old school miniatures. Alright, so let's get back to uh, painting the Churchill Mark Seven Crocodile. Okay, so we are back and I have finished the, uh, I have finished doing my, uh, spot, my spotting of, um, uh, oh Lord, I forgot what I just called this, but anyway, you can see the effect and you got to be careful, I guess, if you don't want to overdo it. I had no problem because I wanted this to look pretty beat up, a pretty serviceable tank. Uh, this sponge uses up a lot of paint, so you will go through a lot of paint. But typically, you know, you don't want to dab it too hard. The harder you dab, the bigger blot you're going to get. Most of these, if you just touch it, it'll give you a pretty good effect. And so you can see, it literally looks like, you know, the metal has been worn off. And you want to kind of get into these areas where, you know, where that would be more likely to happen. You know, kind of in the front there, you know, the edges, any place that, you know, metal is going to probably uh, wear off first or quickest. All right. And then I did the same thing on the little carrier part here. You know, and this one might be a little overdone, but I figured if this... If this is a, a tank that was in the desert and then it went to Italy, you know, it might be pretty beat up by the time it, you know, it get it got into the European theater. So what I am going to do now is I need to paint these tires, which I'm just going to use some Vallejo Black to do that. Uh, and then I'm probably going to hit this with a wash, a brown watered down wash, just to add a little depth to this. Uh... And then I'll see how it looks after that. So what you are looking at here is a U.S. support team in winter gear. I actually finished these a while ago for my uh, boat action. And this is the, these are Americans. And what you get in the kit is you get a sniper. Uh, you get a bazooka, you get a, I think you get a, a, a flamethrower and a spotter. So we will take a look at each of them individually. The first one we have here is the flamethrower. And we're going to get out a chance to focus. So and this is the American flamethrower, or actually this is not the flamethrower. This is the loader for the bazooka. So in this one, I don't think you do get the flamethrower. This is the bazooka's loader. I could tell by the sack and the shell. This is the bazooka, which I really like because the metal version is the only one where you get them with the bazooka nailing and on the shoulders like that. Uh, the plastic one has some bazookas in the sprue, but it's kind of awkward the way you have to uh, you have to uh, position it when you model it and put it together. So I really like this uh, this pose here with the bazooka, and then you get the sniper. Again, this is an excellent pose, American sniper with the winter gear. I think they do do another one that is not in winter gear. And then this is his spotter. So this is the American sniper and bazooka team in winter gear. So just showing you guys a project that I completed recently. All right, let's get back to uh, the Churchill.
So if you are like most people on the planet, you are probably a big Song of Ice and Fire fan uh, or Game of Thrones TV show fan. If you are a gamer, you are probably a big fan of Cool Mini or not. And if you are a gamer and a Game of Thrones fan, then you probably have the A Song of Ice and Fire miniature game by Cool Mini or not. Now, this is what we used to call a rank and flank game. So basically, you buy your miniatures, you paint your miniatures, and you line them up. Uh, the problem with rank and flank games is bases. So, and especially in uh, A Song of Ice and Fire, the bases are a very integral part of the game. And I've played the game, and I actually like the way they work and the system works. But part of the hobby with doing this is not only painting the miniatures, but also painting your bases. And if you are like me, that is something which you have a hard time getting inspired to do. I mean, you know, obviously you can take some paint, you can take a brush, and you can take some ballast or some flock. You know, and you can you can do these and eventually get some real good details on there. But in this hobby tip that I'm going to give you today in this episode of After Painting, I am going to show you how to take these bases and turn them into uh, table-ready painted bases for your painted Game of Thrones miniatures. And it will probably take you all of 30 seconds and then maybe another 30 minutes of drying time to do it. So let me show you what I'm talking about. So we are back and I have uh, this plain old base which you saw before. But I went and picked up some of my Game of Thrones miniatures that I am painting. And these guys are from Stark. Uh not finished with them but as you can see on the base I mean the base looks like a base nothing real special with that uh, but if you take this flow quill moss green diorama paint and I found this I believe you can get these at Hobby Lobby or even your craft stores. If not, I definitely think you can find them at a train store. What these paints do though is, it will paint whatever you spray it with this color, but it will also add this texture which you see. And so I happened to see this in my room and I have no idea why I originally bought this. And I looked at the bases and I said, hmm, what would happen if I sprayed this base with this stuff? You have an instant textured colored base and using the magic of camera we can move this out and we will move this in and there you go and this was actually just a straight test piece that I painted I did want to make sure the miniatures would still fit in there because I was wondering if the texture would uh, obscure the the base so that they wouldn't fit in there would be too snug and it's not now this base was actually not primed before I did it or painted so if you wanted to make yours probably even a little bit darker or you know maybe even add some contrast you could actually uh, spray your base with a solid green and then hit it with this and it would probably even adhere better but this stuff does not come off either that was another thing I wanted to make sure of is that this wouldn't come on here and then just simply peel off but there you go you have an instant flock base you could even dry brush this which I'm probably considering I'm doing I think I'm gonna do one faction kind of in the dark the other faction I will dry brush and you know it obviously took me five seconds to paint it and then I let it dry. Within 30 minutes, it's dry. I would dry it actually overnight, though, before you try to put miniatures or anything in there. But 
I mean, this is very quick and actually, I think, very effective. You can go back and you can add little pieces of uh, trees or flock or anything else you want just to kind of accent it. But 99% of the painting is taken care of for you with this stuff. And they sell this in a variety of colors. You don't have to get the moss green. You can get, you know, a concrete effect. I think you can even get like a raised mud effect or what have you. So I hope that helps, guys. And if you do, would please uh, give me a comment, post a link showing us what you did, and more importantly, share this video. Take care. Next up on the table are some more Game of Thrones uh, Stark. Now, you saw the other ones, which I showed when I was doing the bases, and they're pretty much finished, so I, I didn't feel like the need to kind of bring them back over for this segment. But these are actually, uh, these are also Stark, but they had different shields. So the other ones, I don't know if you remember, or if I can grab one, had kind of the, the metal shields. These had wouldn't have wooden shields. So I decided to do them in a different scheme because obviously they're different. Uh, they're a different type of fighter. I cannot make out their faces though. I think they have like a metal. They have some type of metal. I want to say either mask or uh, chainmail over there covering up most of their face. Because I think I saw an art picture of it, but I haven't painted the flesh. This guy's face I can just about see uh, you know I'm gonna go with the belts and leathers the armor I just did a black wash I will probably kind of dry brush over that with some metal and then I will do the helmets but I wanted to give these guys more of an elite look so I think I have a total oh, focus focus I think I have a total of two four six eight of those so I've still got a lot to go for the Starks, but uh, I wanted to. I want to kind of. I want to kind of put a little bit of a rush on these, but uh, that's just another item from uh, what's on my table. Let's get. Uh, I think we're gonna go back to the, either the painting of the tank, or I think we may be going to uh, my favorite miniatures in my collection. So we're a little further along now. I've got the wash applied. And basically at this step, the only thing I really want to do is just kind of dab some of this off. So I've got kind of a damp brush and you just go through and get the excess. And like I said, this was all just a simple, I think it's called Umber Brown Wash uh, by, is this game color? Umber Wash. And I watered it down mostly. Uh, and then I just put it over everything. And it, what it does is it basically ties together all of the colors, the chipping with the actual color of the vehicle. So instead of it just simply looking like the chipping occurred all at one time, you can now get the effect that, you know, this this vehicle has aged and weathered over time or throughout its campaigns right and pretty much that will be the end of this i'm going to put a decals i'm going to put some decals on this which is i, I will show you that once i get the i have the decals on there but other than that there's really not a lot else that i intend to do with this uh you know, I've added some metal color here or there, which you really can't see. Like I put a little on the uh, the shovels here, and I put a little on the uh, tow cable there, but it's it's not noticeable. It's not anything you would you would pick up, especially not from the camera. But you wouldn't even really pick it up on the game table. But I did go over certain parts with just metal. Uh, this track has got some metal. That one might be a little more 
visible. You can see the shine on it. So I wanted that to look like a, a new piece of replacement track. Probably a little too shiny. All right. I did the same thing with the, uh, you know, the, the fuel trailer. You know, just a little brown wash, black tires. And then once we put the decals on there, we'll be pretty much through. I've got the figure painted. You know, real quick, easy paint job. You know, I wasn't trying to, you know, be too accurate. I just gave him his black beret and, you know, brown top, tan trousers. Uh, right, and so all we're going to do at this point now is we are going to add some decals. So whoever said trying to pick your favorite miniature is like trying to pick your favorite kid was right. Oh, I think that was me. Anyway, this has actually proved to be a bit harder, actually a lot harder than I expected. Because <laughs> every time I pick up one, I'd say, oh, wow, this one is it. And then I pick up another one. So I'm going to show you my honorable mentions before I get to my... Let's just say my top three, maybe top five. So the first honorable mention is this figure here. And this is actually a, uh, a figure that's not quite, I don't think it's quite uh, 28 millimeter. I think it's actually 25 millimeter. And it was made by a company called Ebob Miniatures. Let me, let me sit him up here. So I can focus this camera. So, and I really love these. I have about four of these. This was like a Scottish, Scottish Wars, kind of a William Wallace period that Ebob Miniatures did. And when I got these, I mean, they were just, just excellent miniatures. Finely proportioned. I love the horses, the armor, the surcoats, everything. So that's definitely my first honorable mention. Next up, I couldn't do this without a Dark Sword Miniatures. This is from the Dark Sword Miniatures Game of Thrones line. I believe this is one of the Starks. I don't know if this is actually Eddard Stark. Uh, I don't think it's Rob. It may actually have been Eddard Stark's brother, right? Because it did. I think Eddard had a brother that died before the start of you know the Game of Thrones. I think his brother fought with Robert Baratheon. This is actually just one of my favorite miniatures. It's just again another clean, well proportioned miniature. Next up, as an honorable mention, and this is a line you don't really see a lot. This is a miniature from Gale Force 9's Dungeons and Dragons collection. I do not know his name. I know he is some type of pirate. Uh, I just love the motion and the action in this miniature. You know, I also like the fact that he's kind of a, he's a dark skinned warrior and he's just, he's just so unique, right? I mean, he just has a cool pose, cool action, cool style. Right, there's nothing cliche. There's no tropes involved with this guy. This guy is just pure unique. So that's another honorable mention. Next up, and again, I told you I had, I had a hard time trying to pick anything, including the honorable mentions. Again, this is another one from the exquisite Game of Thrones lines from uh, Dark Sword Miniatures. And I think this one is, I think his name is... Uh, Gormond or something like that. I think he's also uh, he also fights with the Starks. I probably have his name in my in the box, uh, and I'm sure most of you know who this guy is. But again, he is from their Game of Thrones line, and again, just just so finely proportioned. You will notice that the majority of the miniatures I am selecting are actually true proportion, meaning these are not 
They do not have the heroic scale weapons or the 28 millimeter heroic scale. They're all very finely proportioned. And I mean, that just really, really appeals to me. This is another one of the Gale Force 9 miniatures. Again, I don't know what set he's based on. But this is just a, a lovely miniature. Very well proportioned. I mean, now this miniature would probably never get to the top of my collection. I've just got a lot better ones. But I don't know. It's just something I really like about the miniature. The sculpt. So that's another honorable mention. Another honorable mention. This is actually a mounted guy, which I probably could do a separate category for them. This is actually El Cid. And I believe he's either from, is it Gripping Beast? Either Gripping Beast or uh, he's metal. So I don't think this is one of Fire Forges. I know they've done some uh, heroic figures. But this is El Cid. Who's not only, you know, not only one of my favorite miniatures, but he's actually one of my favorite historical characters. Again, another finely proportioned, just wonderful miniature. Even the horse is just wonderful. And the last of our honorable mentions is coming to us from... Is it Metal Metal King Studios? Sean Sutter and his uh I believe it's called Relic Relic Blade. This is like I think he's called the Ranger or the Hunter. Another great miniature. Detail, action, posing. Very good, very perfect proportions. Uh and I think they come with the, uh, yeah, they come with the uh, sculpted base. From what I can tell, this is, although I don't know, I think I might have rebased this guy. Yeah, I don't think they, I don't think they come on these bases. I may have rebased them. I cannot, I cannot tell for sure. Uh, Cause this base is resin and the figure is metal. So I think I did. I think I did rebase him. Because the figure's metal and the base is resin. But again, so those are my honorable mentions. And so when I come back, I will show you the first of my three or five favorites. So this is the finished tank with the markings of, I went with the, the 147th Royal Army Corps, Regiment Royal Army Corps, July of 1944. And I believe they were attached to the 34th Regiment, British Regiment. This is an, this is actually one of their tanks. I think this might've actually been the Scottish uh, one of the Scottish uh, divisions, but this is obviously a Churchill. Now, this regiment did not see combat first until Normandy. Uh, they spent the rest of their time in training. I think they spent like two years in training. But uh, you know, I think it, I think it works. Thirty fourth Armored Brigade is what they were attached to. But this one in particular was the. Uh, the 147th Regiment Royal Armored Corps. So, and that's, that is the markings that I went with. Uh, a few of them I moved around in the back simply because, like, this should have been a little further back. But I had to move it because of the, uh, the attachment for the trailer there. But the rest of the markings are uh, correct where they should appear. So, and I actually picked that one just because it had more, it had more decals than the other one. I think the other version, all you got to put on were these. So, I'm like, ah, oh, I want to use, I definitely wanted to use the, uh, the cross back here. So, I picked whichever one was that, which was the 147th Regiment Royal Armored Corps. But, 
Uh, as you can see, you know, I'm going to call that done. I think the scheme came out pretty good. Maybe a little too much uh, chipping, but I have a lot of worn out tanks. I like to show my tanks as worn out, so I definitely, I prefer this look over the pristine, all, you know, all clean paint jobs, whether it's all green or all brown or all whatever. So I actually do prefer this, but uh, that is the British Tank Churchill Mark 7 Crocodile. Take care. Okay, so I like the way the tank is coming along. Before we get back to that though, I wanted to tell you guys to make sure you hang around till the end of the video because there is going to be a special unboxing. I am not going to show you what is in this box, but I guarantee you, you will want to wait and find out and see. So I am going to open this and I am going to unbox it. Not exactly sure how much of the unboxing I will do, but I'm definitely going to open it, show you guys what's inside and then open that and show you what's inside of that. But if you want to see this unboxing, you are going to have to hang around till the end of the episode of course if you're watching it on youtube you can just scroll forward ah crap so this is my uh polish airborne flamethrower and sniper team from warlord games now these are not quite finished yet i still have to uh finish up the uniforms mostly but it's only a four-man team so you got the sniper and I guess you got another guy on the rifle this is the flamethrower obviously now if you see this figure here with the red beret, you're probably saying, oh, the Polish berets should be green or, you know, blue or purple or whatever. That is correct. But the reason that came out red is I get, I got this confused with the British team. So if you see here, this is the British airborne sniper and flamethrower teams. And it's almost identical to the Polish one. In fact, I'm sure this is probably the same figure since the Polish basically were wearing British uniforms uh, during most of World War II. Again, I think this is probably the same figure. What's different and what I didn't notice is this guy here, even though he has the same pose, he has a beret. And this guy has the metal helmet. So, if I look on here with the Polish one, then I can see, okay, that's the Polish team because he has the beret. Now, this one actually has the helmet. And that one has a helmet. And I think it's the same figure. So basically it's the exact same. It's the exact same figures. Other than the one. The one guy with the beret. But that's about as far as I've gotten with those right now. Okay, so we are back guys and now I am going to do the reveal of my top, I think I'm going to do my top five favorite miniatures in my collection right now that are not in storage. <laughs> so that's a lot of qualifiers, but I think that's accurate. So let's move a few of these out of the way. Let's grab this guy. Let's grab El Cid. Let's grab... Our 
relic blade, another relic blade, and that should be enough space. So before I do the top five, I do have one more honorable, honorable mention. Like I said, this wasn't easy. And that is this figure here. This is a figure I kickstarted from a sculptor named Tom Mason for a series he called, I think he called it Little Knife and Cronin with the K. And this obviously is Cronin, who is straining, even with all those muscles, to bring that massive sword to bear. I just think there was a lot of there was a lot of character in the miniature and uh yeah he almost he almost actually came out on top just just on the strength of the character in the miniature alone in the blade so we're not gonna leave him up here well we'll we'll let him sit there for now all right so number actually I got only got four left so it will be a top five the number four miniature is drum roll please do 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 dum 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 boom and this is a sculpt by uh i believe this one was by uh trey maynard who's actually uh who i've met it's actually a real cool guy I've backed a lot of Trey's uh, Kickstarters. I do not think this one actually was from a Kickstarter. I think he actually did this for Reaper. But it's one of his Barbarians. I don't know. I just, I love Barbarians, as, as, as you will see when I, I go through my favorites. So the third one. And I'm literally making up my mind on these as I go. Again, the third one has to be another Trey Maynard. This one, I do believe, was part of a Kickstarter. Uh, of course, I based it and painted it. Again, this one probably could have been my number one favorite. Right now, anyway. I mean, I think I have some other Barbarian miniatures that I really like. I know I have some other miniatures that I could have put up here in the running. But right now, if you ask me today, these are kind of my favorite. So that brings us to number two. Number two. And number two is from Hassle Free. This is a Hassle Free Barbarian. I think he's called Thud. But I mean, this guy is just, just, just a quintessential barbarian. I mean, I don't really like him as the barbarian type, right? As much as I like, uh, you know, Trey's or even uh, Tom Mason. They have more of the a la Conan barbarian. This guy is kind of more of your beefcake barbarian. The kind of old retro, uh, early 80s, late 70s barbarian guys. They just pull some guy out of a gym and put some underwear on him and make a barbarian movie. That's kind of what he reminds me of. But I mean, he's so well done. He's so massive. I mean, he's just a, a wonderful miniature uh, to have. Whether or not he's your classic ideal of a barbarian. Last but not least. And I think this is also another hassle-free miniature. Is another barbarian. And I, I just love this guy too. This guy obviously has got more of the Conan vibe going. You know, I painted him with the dark hair. He's wearing the trousers the huge axe you know the lighted torch as he can head into a cave or you know a dark ruined castle you know and i'm saying right now i think that's like my number one miniature just i just think it's a freaking cool miniature but i could literally swap these around 
and just any of them could be number one and I could I could justify moving the others back. But actually that was kind of surprised me that they were all barbarians. And I have a lot of other miniatures, some of which I don't think I saw. So I wasn't able to pick them because I do know I have a Drizzt miniature around here somewhere that probably would have ranked a lot higher. But I think I put him up. Wait, 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 wait. Here he is. Here he is. Drizzt Dordan. Yeah. So this guy, I don't think I really did his skin well. Did that kind of bluish color. I'm really not too impressed with that. Uh, I mean, there could have been probably a lot more, a lot more shading. And... Plus, I don't know. I don't really like the pose. I think the pose is a little bit forced. This is a Gale Force 9 miniature. So, yeah, that's probably why he didn't, he didn't make the cut. But Driz is actually one of my favorite characters from D&D &D or whatever game world uh, he comes out of. I haven't read any of the books. All right, guys, so that is it for this segment. Uh, my favorite miniatures in my collection right now, my top three to five. Also on the table is a terrain crate set from Mantic Games. This is called their Wizard Study. Now, I did not do the Mantic Games Kickstarter. Uh, if you've watched my video, one of my weekly wargaming news, you can you will see why I didn't do the Kickstarter. Uh, but I did. I have started picking up some of these uh, post Kickstarter. Most of them on Amazon or at my local store uh, where they were on sale. I think I got this one like 25% off, whatever the retail was. I haven't paid full price for any of them. This one, I do like though. You do get a, get a decent amount in here, uh, especially once you put the discount on. Uh, what I have on my table right now, however, is kind of the astral out there. The ladder, the chair, I think some of the candlesticks and accessories. And so I'll bring them in here. I've primed them all white. And I'm pretty much going to try to paint them uh, like what you see on the box. And uh, I'm not sure how far I will get before this episode ends. But I will try to remember to come back and show you guys uh, the progress I made on these. Okay, let's get back to, uh, I think we're going to uh, do my final selections for my uh, favorite miniatures in my collection right now. Well, if you have hung around this long, I can hear you saying you promised us an unboxing and we want our unboxing. So without further ado, you are going to get your unboxing. So normally when I do unboxings, I already have it out, but I'm just doing this for dramatic effect. I mean, nobody really cares about me opening a plain brown box. But, you know, if I didn't do this, you'd obviously see what it was. And might spoil some of the surprise for you. Might not. So let's do this. So, so far I don't think you can really tell what we're going to be unboxing. Oh, what is this? So this looks like a Gith, Gith, Gith Zerai from 
Nozor's miniatures. I've been wanting to try these guys out or paint them up. Not exactly what sure what they're going to be in my games of Journey to the Overland because I obviously don't have Gith Zerai, but uh, they will probably be some type of uh, they will probably be some type of uh, creature. You know, some some encounter, some weird creature encounter. But that's not what you came to see get unboxed. Of course, if it was, you might be disappointed. Instead. How about that? Some Song of Ice and Fire. Now, obviously, I've already shown you guys my Starks, which came from the Lannister and Stark set. Let's see if I can manage this. Oh, man, this feels nice and heavy. Oh, that feels good. Let's get that out of the way. The Free Folk. Yes, we are unboxing a Song of Ice and Fire Free Folk miniature starter set from Cool Mini or Not. I have wanted this thing actually since Gen Con of last year when they had some, uh, they had some preview, uh, I don't know, I guess they were prototypes of masters of the of the of the miniatures in the box on display in their cabinets. That was back in August. And I mean I was just looking like, oh my goodness, this is when are these coming out? You know, of course they always have quarter of next year and quarter of some other year. So you kind of forget about them. And then of course they started appearing online and everybody started uh getting them and doing unboxings of them and I had none but the problem was when they first came out these boxes these starters were going for like a hundred and ten I even saw a hundred and twenty dollars at some places and I wasn't paying that I mean I already kickstarted the game I wasn't gonna do a kickstarter every time an expansion or something came out but uh, I actually got this at a good good price which I'm not going to tell you what I paid for it and I'm not going to tell you where I got it because then you might go there and buy up the other one that I'm waiting to pick up as soon as I get some funds. This is the battle board, which I love these. I love the way they work in the game. So this says one enemy unit must make a panic test, restore up to three rooms, remove one condition, draw two tactic cards, Place any one condition token on an enemy unit. So that's kind of your your standard stuff. I don't think that changes based on your factions. This is probably... I'm not sure. This looks like the actual rule book. Since this is a starter, you actually get the actual rule book. Not just uh, the faction rule book. So I think that's kind of a nice touch. Uh... By now, you should have seen the video where I talked about doing the bases. So, you know, maybe you can even get a, a white type of uh, textured spray to do the bases for these. This is very nice. Again, if this, since this is a starter, you're going to get more of the trees, the ruler, the tokens, conditions. So, this actually, you can, you can stack these and you can actually create some good wooded scenes they are double sided so these are just massive casualties which it's kind of funny because these are not soldier casualties these are civilian casualties so that's pretty cool you get some more tokens so you mean well i call them tokens but templates or uh terrain counters so you could actually combine these if you have the Lannister and Stark box, you can combine these and actually make a real decent layout. They obviously come out pretty well. This I think is different. This is not these were not in these were not included in the uh these were not included in the uh Lannister and Stark starter set. And I think these are for like a siege 
or the barricades for the free folk. And I think it's like supposed to represent a portion of the wall or something. But I don't remember seeing those. These look like some kind of uh, stakes in the ground. Some more stakes. Uh, right here, these would basically are for stopping charges by cavalry. Uh, so that's interesting. Tormund Giant's Bane, as I think he's like the featured commander in this box. Some cards. I'm not going to go over the cards and things. If you don't play the game, probably they won't make any difference to you. I will show you these dice. They look pretty cool. These are green. I think the other factions have, uh, is it red and uh, blue or gray? And this should be the box of miniatures ah yes there we go so I will say this the Giants are not as big as they look in the promos so these are your two Giants and in the promotions that I saw they looked a lot bigger these guys are not as big as they are in the promos. In fact, I mean, relatively speaking, I'm not even sure if they're as big proportionally as they are in the movie. So I, I, I think in the movies, I mean, they're carrying people like up on their shoulders or something like kids. But then again, I don't know. I could be, I could be mistaken. They are good models regardless I mean these are excellent models and I actually preferred the Giants this size I have some of the larger bigger giant giants but for my game of journey to the overland these are perfect these are gonna be perfect size for my journey to the overland game we've got some uh, some wildlings looks like they have Looks like they have slingers. So there's some slingers. We have some spears. Which these are excellent. I mean, I don't have... See, I don't have figures like this for any of my rank and flank games. Like a, a quick moving spear unit. Normally, if you get spears, they're just peasants. Some bows. Barbarians with bows. You don't... I don't have... I don't have figures like that. I don't have a unit of barbarians that are using bows. The commanders, right? I mean, at this point, it really doesn't matter who they are. I think one is Tormund. Uh, I think the other one is Mance Raider. The king, king beyond the mountain or something like that. I think this is Mance Raider, if you can see that. Uh... And then we've got, again, and this is mostly, I'm not going to take all these out because these are mostly the same. But you've got some uh, axes down here. You have double axes here, which is actually kind of nice. They're wielding double axes. And this unit is wielding, looks almost like some type of hammer and a mace. So you have some double axes, and then you have some units wielding a hammer and a mace. And so, let's see if we can get a closer look at this. And I will, let me see if I can bring up one of the giants. So, this just shows you some of the detail on this guy. Okay, so I yeah. wanted to cut to my uh, painting table to give you a better look at the Free Folk Giants. So, so that's a little bit of the detail on the face, the arms, and the clothing. 
This here is, I don't know, I don't think this is Man's Rainer. Uh, I'd have to look his name up. But this is one of the leaders, I think, of the uh, Free Folk. To give you a scale comparison. So, I don't know, I'd say the giant is about one and a half times as tall as him. And so for reference, I looked up this image from uh, a Game of Thrones shoot. And as you can see, this giant is probably about twice as tall as a man. So, you know, if we were to take that and kind of compare it to what you get in the game or what you get in the box... Um, I would say you know I'd say it's close I'd say it's it's probably close to kind of the same same scale I, it's, a, it's a little bit smaller I think I think it would be fair to say now having done that though if we were to compare this giant to other giants and I got a couple out of my collection so this is a Fomorian this is from the old Dungeons and Dragons miniatures line so if you can see this Fomorian I mean this he basically dwarfs their giant and he's he's bending down right he's basically bending down and I mean, if he stood, stood full up, he'd probably be one and a half times as tall as their giant. And then this is an old mage knight giant. And again, he dwarfs, he dwarfs this giant from the Game of Thrones free, free folk faction. Now, I... I actually probably expected the Giants to be closer to this guy, right? I, I didn't I didn't expect them to be like the towering Giants that uh was that Mantic Games has created for their uh, Vanguard game, but I expected them to be closer to this uh, This here Yeah, I guess that is a giant. I mean, it's sort of like Andre the Giant was a giant in the sense, you know, he towered over other men. But anyway, hopefully that helps you out if you take a look at that. Let's take a look, get a little bit of uh, up-close detail with some of the uh, other miniatures in the box. First, let's look at the other giant, who's about the same size, so I'm not going to do the scale comparison. And this guy has like a massive, massive club or stick or whatever. I do like that you get two. That definitely, uh, I think that definitely matches the theme. You don't have to pay to get pick one or the other. These are the slingers that I was talking about, which I love those. Those are some excellent sculpts. I think these are the spearmen. Again, excellent sculpts. Uh, I think they all, they're pretty much the same face. Same warrior, same warrior looking warrior. The bows. Which this is actually a real nice sculpt if you're looking for some barbarian types that are wielding bows. Uh, before we get to the leaders, let's get to some more line troops. These guys have some type of maces. Actually, they have like double maces. These are double axes, which I think is cool because it kind of reflects the brutal, brutal nature of these guys. They have no shields to defend themselves. They're just straight out attackers. These guys have basically a flail and a mace or an axe, improvised axe. So you get basically loads of them. This is, I guess, a kind of a leader figure. 
He has double axes, but you get two of those. So that's kind of a leader figure, which I think is pretty decent. Now, I'm going to take out the leaders of the faction. And as I do so, let me, I'm going to run real quick and get my, get my rule book so I can show you exactly who each one of these uh, is intended to be in the game. Now, before I get to the leaders, in case nobody has done it before, I thought I would give you a scale comparison of the figures that come in the uh, Song of Ice and Fire miniature game, in case you haven't bought the game and you're wondering whether you could use it. So this is a D&D &D miniature, you know, which which is kind of your pre-painted standard. I think they still use this for the size for like games like Wrath of a Shardalon and um, the other box games that they sell with that name. Uh, this is a Frostgrave metal figure, one of their barbarians. This is obviously our Free Folk, A Song of Ice and Fire miniature. This is a Reaper miniature that has been put on another base. So I've actually rebased him or basically glued his base to a plastic base. This is a Games Workshop Lord of the Rings scale figure. Uh, I think it's either one of the Men of Umbar or Hairdrum or something. But that will give you an idea. I mean, obviously, I think it, you know, it scales in. It fits in with whatever you would want to use it for. I mean, I don't really see any noticeable difference. It's a little bit bigger, kind of, than the Frostgrave figures. You know, it does, you know, it does kind of, if he was standing straight up, he'd be, you know, noticeably taller. But then again, he's on a thinner base. But uh, that's just to give you some idea of the scale. Now we will take a look at the leaders you get in the box. So this one that I looked at earlier, it's called Tormund Giant's Bane. And I think you get another version of him in the, the regular starter box. Uh, this here is called Lady Val or Lady Val, which I don't quite remember her from the show. I think she kind of arrives at the last minute when, uh, when the free folk are attacking uh, the Night's Watch. She's not the one I think that Jon Snow falls in love with, which I do not see her in this box. This is obviously uh, Mance, Mance Raider, which I definitely like this figure. And this one is called Craster. I don't quite remember Craster. I think Craster, is this the one with the daughters or something? I'm not sure, but that's Craster. So those are the leaders you get in the box. And obviously they have cards that will detail their skills and abilities. But anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed that. I thought I'd sneak that in. Everybody's done unboxing, so I didn't want to do a separate video uh, just unboxing it. And before I go for good, I thought I'd uh, give you guys one last look at the Mantic Games Terrain Crate pieces from the Wizard Study. So, I made some progress on the ladder, on the little candelabras. on the chair. Probably put a wash over that. The astrolabe, the mirror, and the fountain, which I had to base because it kept tipping over. So I'll probably put some grass and stuff around the base. But basically, that's kind of the set. It, it, it's probably that probably has been about maybe an hour's worth of work on it. So I should finish that up in another, you know, another half hour to 45 minutes. Because most of these just need some little touch-ups now. 
But that's it, guys. That's going to be another episode of After Painting. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Please keep subscribing. We're trying to get to 1,000 subscribers. So hopefully we will do this again on a monthly basis. Uh, appreciate all the people that have subscribed. Uh, if you want to support the channel even further, take a look at our Patreon account. Other than that, uh, we'll probably have another episode of the Solo Wargaming Show podcast coming up in about a week, maybe two weeks. That will be posted on Patreon, and then probably a week or two after that, it will be uploaded to YouTube. So either way, though, guys, take care. God bless.